And as far as I recall, I I recall reading an article where you mention where you are mentioning some kind of out of body experience uh, that you know suits very well into how uh, as a, as a Jolie speaks about that type of uh, experiences. Could you uh, could you tell us about what under what circumstances uh, did you experience this? That happened 25 years before I discovered psychosynthesis. Uh-huh. I was in a hospital with cancer, facing death. Mm. I was very frightened. And I didn't let myself know that I was frightened. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was so scared. I basically, there were two experiences that were within a few months of each other. The first was an inner interior visionary experience, which only years later after psychosynthesis came in my life, I could look back and say, oh, I had a direct encounter with higher self mm. initiated by higher self. But I was floundering and going oh, inwardly, just outwardly, I was numb and I was being bombarded with chemotherapy. Mm. The worst physical experience of my life. It was brutal. Mm. But I went into a spiritual experience and encountered um that ineffable, indescribable being in which I felt completely loved and accepted and known mm. enough so that I was shown almost a, almost like a near-death experience, a pr- panorama of many years of my life uh, condensed into a few seconds yeah. in which I knew how I had done and basically caused my cancer. And I was given basically a choice to use an active will to choose healing, mm. which I did. A few months later, uh, because I didn't get any indication to stop my chemotherapy or my treatment, so I kept on going, and it was more and more brutal, finally ending in a major surgery looking for whatever was left of the cancer after this brutal chemotherapy. Uh, and I was in the intensive care unit. And my body was screaming bloody murder because I had been sliced right up and down the middle, Mm. like a 12 or 15 inch incision. Um, I was cut wide open and then sewed back together again. And I literally just popped out, I guess, Mm. because I was over somewhere in the room listening and looking at my body screaming bloody murder and saying, oh, you never did that before. Mm. And looking at my friends who were at the door, who weren't allowed in, and saying, I wish I could tell them that I'm really okay. Mm. Yes, my body is screaming, but I think I'll uh, amuse myself for a while. And I sort of called up an image of a marching band at a football game playing Bach in the middle of a football game. Mm. (laughs) And uh, realized that I was okay. Yeah. And then at some point I popped back into my body and, oh, the pain came back. Mm. But apparently, I was able to handle the pain at that point, so I popped back in. This was not something that was done willingly. It had been done, oh, it happened, it happened. Mm. I happened, I was out, it happened, I was back in. But I was quite clearly, um, had a very clear consciousness that I'm over here and my body's over there. Yeah. And I felt rather um, like a parent saying, I wish I could... I wish I could help you, you know, and I will when I get back in. I'll I'll help you in whatever way I can. But but I, it was mostly the realization that I'm okay, mm. and I will be okay. When you were out of the body, uh, were there any kind of um, you know some people who have these types of out of body experience have some kind of recollection or some kind of um, higher higher spiritual. Uh, experience where they see the purpose of life or they have to t- take a new direction in life or some kind of a guidance. Were there any type of these uh, experience involved in, in this? Not in the, the OOB in the, in the hospital, in the ICU. Mm. That happened in the previous one that I mentioned. Mm. I was basically, you could say I was out of body. I was, I was out of time and space. Yes. And the visionary experience in my hospital bed with the higher self. Mm. And that completely turned my life around. Okay. Indeed. That was a complete 180 degree reversal. I came in there being an arrogant fool, a materialist, an atheist, a jerk, mm. um, 
And in the space of, I have no idea how much time it took, whether it was 15 seconds or you know, it could have been hours, have no idea. No. But when it came out, I was loved by the universe. Mm. I felt safe. I felt loved. Mm. I knew I didn't have to think about whether I believed in God or a higher power. It was there. Yeah. <laughs> And so that is what shifted things around for me. Mm -hmm. By the time I had the OOB in the ICU, three or four months later, um, this was already established because I, I had no more fear of dying. Mm. Uh, the, the visionary experience, um, basically, I hadn't explored life or death, but it was, I was assured, you made the choice, the power comes from here, this other source. Yeah, this power will assure if you choose life, you'll live. Period. Done. Mm. No problem. You're done. So mm. go ahead now. Mm. So in the hospital ICU, when I was, my body was screaming. I had no fear. I just hurt uh, un unbearably. Yeah. Um. So popping out of the body and looking and being basically sympathetic toward what the suffering. At the time, I didn't say that I put you through, <laughs> um, but the suffering that we, the collective, myself, had was undergoing. Mm. It was a, a, a sympathetic moment. And then when I went back in, it was like, okay, now we've got to finish the journey, which mm. is going to be through physical pain. Yeah. But but the switch around, the, the revelation had already happened. Yeah. So you can say that one of the central affirmations of uh, Asajoli in his uh, disidentification exercise is that I have a body, but I'm not my body. And you have that direct experience that, that you, consciousness itself, can exist, exist outside your body and also outside time and space, or outside time at least, um, because you say it could have, it could happen 15 seconds or perhaps hours. You were not aware, so you were in another dimension, so to speak. Yes, in the in the visionary experience, it was not in any kind of known spatial temporal dimension. It was mm. completely elsewhere or yeah. nowhere in yeah. no time, no space. Yeah. Um, I had some images that I called up. They were very evocative, um, but I knew that those were, were things that I, I was using. I even knew at the time that I was using this to symbolize uh, what was happening. Mm. Um, I symbolized getting into it since I had I had I had visualized and not deliberately, but it just I got the vision of walking down a long series of steps mm -hmm. uh, down a deep, deep spiral staircase until I came to this the lowest foundational place which was nowhere. Mm. And what I experienced was um, an inner voice, which was not, wasn't even a voice. It was direct communication. Mm. Um, uh, just the knowing that was, I guess, translated into language I could understand. Mm. Um, but yeah. And in the, in the ICU, I certainly had the experience of being in a place consciously across the room. And my body was over there. Yes. And my friends were over there. Yeah. And um, so I could feel a very distinct sense of here am I and there is my body. Mm. So it was experiencing a disidentified state. And yet I was feeling very, very at peace, very okay and very sympathetic and, mm. and strong. Mm. Um, so you can say you were not in, from one point of view, you can say you were separate from your conscience from your body, but actually you still were linked to the body because you could enter the body again. Uh, so we, we, we say that, uh, sometimes we say that uh, I have a body, but I'm not my body. And we mean that we, we the identity consciousness itself is distinct from the body, but not totally separated from the body because then we would be dead. Yes, that that was the experience. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Long before I had any of this language to describe yes, it. Yes, exactly. And that's that's my basic uh, point here is that in some way you you had psychosensitive training 
uh, you know, through life before <laughs> yes. you enter the more formal training. Uh, because, you know, these types of experience that you are pointing to uh, is impossible to uh, to transmit through a training. You have to have them yourself. It's an inner experience. And if you don't have that kind of experience, it, it is only belief. Uh, a lot of the theories in psychosynthesis is about a superconscious, about a higher self. It remains within the um, region of faith rather than experience. But you, in some way, were giving some kind of a foundation for psychosynthesis before even starting at it at a more formal level. Yes, for sure. There, there was an experiential base that I could eventually, once I had the language for it, I could say, oh, that's what happened to me. Yep, yeah. that's it. And uh, like you say, by the time I, I put that together, I could realize, oh, this isn't just theory for me. This mm. is something, you know, uh, actually the, the deepest part of psychosynthesis, which is to me the higher self, the teaching of the higher self and how it connects, I'd already had. Mm. So I'm kind of putting together the nuts and bolts after that exactly. uh, to build up the, the structure. But the foundation, um, the bottom and the top were already mm. there. Mm. Mm. For me. And it must have been a, a quite a, an intense and radical transformation. You were a materialist uh, before this experience. And then, pop, you, your consciousness is open to a totally new dimension. And, and then a new Jan Kuniholm <laughs> uh, opens up. Yes, yes. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd been... Um scornful of any kind of religion and spirituality mm. um, for many years before I got in the hospital. Um, in fact, I sort of, um, well, I don't have to go into it. I was just nasty. <laughs> I was nasty about it. I had no use for it whatsoever. No. Um, and But I had become exposed because I was quite a rationalist. I, I fancied myself quite a rationalist. 